Good evening. On behalf of the Hopkinton Women's Club, I'd like to welcome you to the 31st annual Meet the Candidates Night. My name is Kathy Hebden, and I will be the moderator for this program. The Hopkinton's Women's Club was founded in 1920 when women were gaining the right to vote. And each year, we organize Candidates Night to aid all citizens as they determine how to cast their vote on the upcoming election. We welcome new members to the Women's Club and encourage anyone interested to join and visit our website at hopkintonwomensclub.org. We will begin the program with an opening statement from each candidate. Each person will have a limit of two minutes for opening remarks. Our time is this evening, uh, a women's club member and two student volunteers from Hopkinton High School. They'll hold up a sign periodically to indicate how much time candidates have remaining. If necessary, they'll ring a bell to signify the end of two minutes and we will move on. Audience members, please hold your applause until all the opening statements have been completed. Now, on to our first speaker. The candidates for selectmen, please. In alphabetical order, for Board of Selectmen, we'll first hear from Patrick Atwell. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me this evening. Uh, it's a fun event. A little nervous, but uh, we'll get over it. So my name is Patrick Atwell. Uh, I live in Hopkinton for the past five years. I'm married and I have four children. Um, I'm a graduate of Northeastern University that's finishing up my doctorate at Mass School of Law as well, studying employment law and labor law. So why did I choose to run? I have kids in the school system. I moved here because of the school system, and I want to make sure that this town continues to grow to benefit them. There's a lot going on in this town, a lot of questions that can't be answered, so I think it's time for some change. Uh, times are changing. The town needs to grow as well, and I hope I can add that to it. So my experience, I've been a union representative for the IBW, that's the electrical workers, for 20 years. So I handled their mediation and their arbitration grievances. I was a delegate for them for the International in Washington, D.C., and I did some lobbying work at the State House for about 10 to 12 years. So I have experience in negotiation and mediation, and I think that with that education that I have, the experience I have with the IBW, I can bring it, add it to the table for the Board of Selectmen, and that'll be my useful tool, and that's what I can bring. Thank you, Brian Herr, candidate for re-election and Republican Caucus nominee. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Herr, candidate for Selectmen here in Hockington. I'll be seeking my fourth and final term should the voters uh, take me back. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the Women's Club for hosting this evening. This is a great event, a great opportunity for the residents of Hopkinton to get to know the candidates. I want to thank all the candidates that are here tonight as well. It's great to see some new faces in the room, and uh, this tells me that Hopkinton's form of democracy is going to be very vibrant in the years to come, so great to see everybody here tonight. Uh, I'm running for my fourth and final term because there's a lot going on in Hopkinton, to Patrick's point, and there are a few key projects that I'd like to see move forward and, and get finalized. Uh, the downtown quarter project I think is a great opportunity for Hopkinton to put a great stamp on our historic downtown. Uh, the turf fields project is a great opportunity for all of the community to invest in and enjoy a great new asset uh, for our children. We've got great schools in Hopkinton but we need great assets to go along with those schools and facilities. And I obviously want to keep an eye on the fiscal uh, situation here in Hopkinton. We've got a big change coming up uh, this year with our tax bills. We're having to pay now for the new school, the new library, and the new DPW facility. And uh, I think it's important that we have people in the chair that understand f municipal finance and understand what it's going to take to balance the books over the next several years, which are going to be challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Our friend Nazrula, nomination papers and Democratic Caucus nominee. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Women's Club as well and uh, thank everyone here uh, for welcoming me. Uh, my name is Irfan Nasrola, and I'm uh, running for Board of Selectmen. Community service is something that's been ingrained in me from a very young age. I learned a lesson from my dad, who came here from Pakistan, immigrated to the United States, recruited, and he had the opportunity to go to some of the top hospitals in Boston. But instead, he chose to come to Milford and serve the underserved communities in an effort to help all around him. What he taught me is that we have family, 
and we have community. We have a small circle and then a larger circle. And we rely on both of those throughout. My family moved here in 81. And I got to know this community. I got to know that I love this outer circle. I love this community. And this is a community that I want to help. Throughout the years, I left for college. I left for college, left for law school. I kept coming back here and realized when I got back, I am now uniquely qualified as an attorney, as an environmental lawyer, um, and uh, as a real estate lawyer as well, to help serve my community. I feel I'm uniquely qualified. Past year, I've been working on the planning board, and um, I, found my, I found that to be tremendously rewarding, more so because I've gotten to know everyone in the community. Not everyone, but a lot of people in the community. I've gotten to know the other candidates. I've gotten to know uh, the other people serving on the various boards. And I want to thank all of them for their tremendous work and dedication. I want to continue my family legacy and help my community grow through, these, through the uh, next few years. Thank you very much. For Board of Assessors, Leslie Fakari, candidate for re-election, Democratic Caucus nominee. In the interest of time, uh, when you're uh, done, you, you can feel free to sit down and the next person can come up. Great. Thank you, Kathy and the Hopkinton Women's Club and HCAM for hosting again this year. And thank you for everybody in the audience and watching on TV. My name is Leslie Fakari, and I'm running for re-election to the Board of Assessors for the three-year term. Last May, many of you came out and su supported me for the one-year term. Thank you. I ran in 2017 because I was looking for new ways to get involved and serve and lead and contribute in new ways. Serving on the board this past year has been a great opportunity to do that. And I want to continue next year and the next few years. Now, becoming an assessor, becoming an assessor takes some training. I had to learn about property valuation process and the oversight that we get from the Mass Department of Health. I had to learn about exemptions and abatements, and I had to learn how we determine the annual tax rate. During the meetings, I used my understanding of legal frameworks and my human resources experience considering both data and the impact on people to make decisions and recommendations on the board. It was gratifying to work with other committed members. So we have uh, Leah uh, Rafferty and uh, Mary Jo Lafreniere on the board with us, and we're very, very committed to doing a good job. I also wanted to take a moment to recognize John Neese, Ruth Anderson, and Stuart Carter. They are our assessing department. Their expertise and proactivity and professionalism that they demonstrate every day adds great value to our town. I'm honored to be here tonight as part of a large group of diverse candidates, all willing to give of their time and engage in dialogue and model collaboration to keep our town strong. The sense of service and community that we see here tonight is why my husband and I very much enjoy living in Hopkinton. I ask for your vote on May 21st. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. For Board of Health, um, Richard Jacobs let me know that he couldn't make it. And Michael King was coming, but uh, he's celebrating the birth of a baby daughter. Yes. And so yes. I thought that was a, a great so, time to be here. So Michael couldn't be here because of uh, Riley Ann King. So She's Leslie's going to uh, present some of his remarks. Yes. Yeah, so, so Michael asked if I would um, stand up and, and say a few things for him and, and read his candidate statement. So Michael is running for re-election for the Board of Health for a three-year term. The Board of Health plays a vital role in our community by working to control the spread of disease, to enforce sanitary codes, and to protect the environment. For the last year, he has been able to bring his knowledge, experience, and address very I various items brought before the Board of Health. He is, in the, he is a process development specialist with many years of experience working in the biotech industry. His work has provided him with valuable experience solving open-ended problems as well as exposure to environmental health and safety policies. So he says, since moving to Hopkinton, I have been involved in various activities and aspects of town government. 
Initially, I participated in the Zoning Advisory Committee to help draft zoning bylaws. I am currently serving on the Board of Health. As I continue to become in involved in town activities, I am constantly reminded of the many reasons why my wife and I chose to move to Hopkinton to raise our family. I am invested in this community and I am passionate about the environmental issues that affect our town. I would be honored, as he says, to be reelected to the Board of Health and he respectfully asks for your vote on May 21st. And I just wanted to note that um, Michael has gotten endorsements from the other members of the Board of Health. They feel his contributions over the past year and what they have to learn so quickly has been very valuable and they're recommending him for the position also. Thank you. And thank you for allowing me to represent him and that beautiful little girl. Mm -hmm. uh, candidates for the library trustees, please. For the Board of Library Trustees for three years, Nanette Kenrick, nomination papers. Yes, um, my name is Nanette Kenrick. Um, I don't know why I decided to run for the Library Board of Trustees, except that my career and half my life have been devoted to libraries. Um, I worked for seven years for American Optical Corporation as their research librarian. I worked for Worcester State Hospital for nine years as their professional librarian. And I worked for Quincy Gibbon Community College as their evening division librarian for one year. Um, I have asked by a lot of people, um, what can we expect of you as library board of trustee? And I want to tell them I'm concerned about the accessibility of the library. The library hours are 10 to 8. Um, a lot of people work 8 to 5. That means they get home, they have supper, that leaves them only an hour to go to the library. I'd like to see them have the library open till 10 o'clock one day a week. And there also are a lot of people who work six days a week and they would like to go to the library too. Maybe they could have Sunday hours. Um, if you don't like to read books, magazines there are great. Try Astronomy, Birds in Bloom, Atlantic, Business Week, Cooking Like Glamour, Kiplinger's, Money, Audubon, Quilting, Yankee, all those magazines, you don't have to pay for the subscriptions. Um, I'd like to see more offered to the seniors at the Senior Center. Right now they have used books. They don't have any audio books and they don't have any periodicals. Uh, in closing, um, I want every taxpayer in this town to take their slice out of the library budget. Thank you. Thank you. Stanley Polnick, nomination papers, Democratic Caucus. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all for coming out on this dreary night. Um, my name is Stan Polnick. I have been a, pretty much a lifelong resident of Hopkinton. Um, I've served three different terms as uh, a member of the Board of Trustees. I was appointed by the selectmen to the very first Board of Trustees. I've been elected a couple of times. Um, the library is kind of a passion for me. Um, it's been a big part of my life ever since I was a little kid. And uh, being part of this board means an awful lot to me. Um, I served as co-chairman for one term. I'm a member of the Friends of the Library, and I've been a volunteer at the library for over 12 years. Um, there isn't a whole lot more that I can say about that. It's, it's, it's a passion for me, and it, I, I, I've worked with some very dedicated people on that board. There's a lot of hours that have to be put in, and I'm willing to do it. Um, we are trying, we were, when I was on the board, and I, I believe they still are, um, trying to become more accessible to the public. Um, the library is going through the same changes that the community is going through. The demographic of the town is changing. The library is trying to change to accommodate that uh, with different programs and things like that. Um, I, I want to really be a part of this. So I ask for your vote on May 21st. For constable, for three-year position, Francis Duraso, candidate for re-election, Democratic Caucus nominee. Hi, thank you. I am also running on papers. Uh, collecting nomination uh, from, from citizens is a very important part of running. It's a little bit harder to do without Colellas being Colellas anymore. Uh, 
but uh, it's a it's a hard it's hard to do, and I'm glad so many people here have done it. And also running through caucus, I'm proud that our town is one of the few in in the state that still has a caucus system. Um, I want to thank the town meeting from last year that preserved our constable positions, uh, overwhelmingly so. We have three elected constables, three appointed constables, and we have a full flight of constables for the first time in a long time. And um, I'm glad that. Uh, I am running again for re-election um, for a three-year term this time, so I don't have to run again for a little bit. Um, I like helping people doing this position. It's, um, I've done very few things, four or five things over the past year, um, but it's always good to be asked to help and do what I can. Um, I really can't, you know. Um, my opponents dropped out, so I have one minute left. My opponents dropped out, so uh, I really don't have a race to be in. Uh, but I wanted to be here to say thank you to the voters, and I'm looking forward to Election Day. And thank you for everyone here that's running. Um, I'm also on the planning board, so there's some interesting planning board candidates coming up with some very interesting things to say. And uh, thank you for the Women's Club for running this. This is very important for the voters to be able to see who they're actually going to be voting for. Thank you. And also, I see the rest of my time because I don't really. Okay. <laughs> uh, for planning board for a uh, five year position, Deborah Fine Vrub. Thank you very much. Thank Democratic you. Caucus nominee, sorry. Um, thank you, HCAM, and thank you, the Women's Club, for hosting this event. Um, I'm Deborah S. Feinbrook, and I'm running for the planning board. My family came to Hopkinton 20 years ago from Maryland. We moved, we love the small town um, feel, the history of the start of the marathon, the town common with its historic homes. Um, I've had the honor of very many varied experiences on the town and community level. What's wonderful is that I would not have been able to have that experience in Maryland. There, the democratic process wasn't quite so democratic. And I am deeply appreciative of the, to be able to participate with Hopkinton town government. Prior to moving to Hopkinton, I studied architecture at the University of Detroit and University of Pennsylvania. I learned from well-known leaders and thinkers in planning and preservation fields. Now I'm a small practitioner, and my architecture business is based here in Hopkinton. The, there is a delicate balance between the growth in Hopkinton's residential and commercial communities. And as a member of the planning board, I look forward to, to the challenge of finding this balance through further exploring Hopkinton's built and natural environment. As an architect the member, and a member of the historic district, downtown revitalization, and zoning advisory committees, I've written and used codes for both residential development and commercial um, occupancies. I have a solid understanding of how they impact people and individual at the individual and community level. The new developments have ushered in unprecedented growth. I, like, I would like your vote for planning board so that I can help Hopkinton focus on future and present detailed ramifications of this growth and all its complexities. I have the ability to work objectively and produce results results driven by complex decisions. I respectfully ask for your vote May 21st. Mark Hyman, Republican Caucus nominee. Good evening. My name is Mark Hyman and I'm running for planning board. Um, like Deb, I moved here from Maryland a little bit more recently, about five years ago, uh, with my family. Uh, my son's in the Hopkinton schools. Um, we moved here, like um, some others have already said, uh, because of the great schools and the wonderful small town character of Hopkinton. Uh, I've really been taken with uh, the town meeting form of government. I grew up about uh, 120 miles to the west in New York, uh, and uh, we didn't have this, and it's, it's, very, um, uh, it's very engaging, um, and I've enjoyed the town meetings I've attended. Uh, I joined um, the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, about four years ago um, because the town was looking for volunteers for the various boards, and I wanted to help. I'm an attorney by trade. Uh, patent attorney and uh, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals sounded like a, a good fit. Um, I've done that now for four years, including serving as chairman for three, and um, I've seen firsthand some of the challenging uh, planning decisions that the towns had to make. Um, I worked on the Hopkinton Muse um, comprehensive permit, uh, both planning and uh, zoning had to work on that. Um, and I've also seen some of the challenges that have come from all the growth in town, um, the traffic, um, you know, the congestion over by Starbucks, um, a, a number of other issues, and the impact that it's had on the schools in terms of uh, budgets and such, particularly this year, as some of the selectmen candidates mentioned. 
So I'd like to serve on planning board to bring my experience that I've, I've had with the ZBA um, to that um, so I can um, help work through land use issues um, on the planning board and, and, and also help um, encourage the, you know, the civil discourse uh, that, com that we need when we're dealing with some very uh, contentious issues uh, that people feel very deeply about because they affect their neighborhoods. So I respectfully ask for your vote on May 21st. Thank you. And Mary Larson Marlowe, nomination papers, Democratic Caucus nominee. Thank you. Thank you to the Hopkinton Women's Club and to HCAM for hosting this important event. I'm Mary Larson Marlowe, and I'm running for planning board. My husband and I have been living in Hopkinton for 15 years, and we have two children uh, who are now 13 and 15 in the school system. I know we all agree that this is a wonderful place to live, and I'm committed to ensuring that we balance growth with respect for the character and charm of Hopkinton. We enjoy the Center for the Arts, the Public Library, the many local businesses, trails, and parks, as well as the people who make up this community. I'm a volunteer for the Zoning Advisory Committee, and that experience has increased my interest in town government. I'm also a transplant, although not from Maryland, this time, this time from Wisconsin. <laughs> I approach the challenges of town growth without preconceived notions, but rather with the ability to listen to the many perspectives and work with people to develop solutions. I earned my bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an MBA from Boston University. I've been working in project management in the biopharmaceutical industry for the last 25 years, leading teams to plan and accomplish multi-million dollar, multi-year projects. I've been successful in my career because of my ability to engage people with many different perspectives. Balancing the needs and concerns of residents, businesses, and public, public use is complex but achievable. And I ask for your vote in town election on May 21st. Thank you. School committee for three years, Amanda. Fagiano, nomination papers. Thank you to the Women's Club and to HCAM. My name is Amanda Fargiano, and I am running for school committee because I am passionate about supporting growth for all students, and I'm committed to educational excellence. My husband and two sons and myself moved here from Framingham in 2010, and we were drawn here in part, of course, by the high quality schools. With my oldest now in college and my younger son a sophomore, I'm excited for the chance to give back uh, as a member of school committee, and I'd like to tell you why. First, having gone from K to 12 with my older son, I feel like I have a much better perspective and understanding on how all the pieces of the puzzle fit together to prepare our students for post-secondary life. Second, we are at a time of transition in our district with a new superintendent coming on board and our district-wide six-year strategic plan soon up for renewal. The strategic plan guides each school's improvement plan and also our investments. And and I would like to work to ensure that the next strategic plan continues to provide a framework to equip our students with the skills they need to succeed in today's complex global economy. Finally, maybe most importantly, now is an exciting time for Hopkinton. We are growing and diversifying. It is important to me that we actively embrace all families and children and that we work to meet the unique needs of each learner. While it's clear from this year's budget process that growth and change are hard, I look forward to the challenge of balancing the needs of the schools with the broader community interests. My extensive volunteer work across two different towns has helped me understand the importance of school committee in enriching the whole community. I have coached kids in soccer, robotics, DI, and other extracurricular activities. I have served as a member of the HPTA, HMS School Council, Youth Commission, and the 2017 Superintendent Search Committee. And I've gained broad civic experience through the Metro West Leadership Academy and also in my current role as the Vice President of EHOP. These experiences, along with my own educational background, including a BA from Harvard and an MBA from BU, and my professional work in IT, finance, and HR, have informed the perspective that I hope to bring to school committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Margaret Tyler, nomination papers. Thank you to HCAM and to the Hopkinton Women's Group for providing the town with this instructive and generative occasion. I am Meg Tyler, and I've lived in Hopkinton for 13 years. I have two kids, a 23-year-old and a 9-year-old. By day, I'm a professor of ethical philosophy at Boston University. 
um, by night and also by day, I should say. I'm a mom and a tireless advocate for students with disabilities. I love young people. They are, after all, our future unfolding. And I am cognizant that the better we support and serve them now, the sturdier the groundwork for our future. Call me quaint, but I think discussions of education should remain student-centered. It's easy to lose sight of the individual student's needs and strengths when poring over labyrinthine school budgets, but I believe that's actually our responsibility, to act with care, to fully support the students in our town, to support the parents who are scrambling to do what's best for them, and the teachers who are working to enrich the minds of our children. I like to work collaborati collaboratively, to find ways to reach agreement peaceably. This requires a powerful capacity for listening and respecting the points of view of others. It also requires perseverance. I hope you'll vote for me on May 21st, and I feel privileged to run alongside Amanda Fargiano. Thank you. Let's now give a round of applause for all the candidates. Great job. It's time for the second portion of our program, the question and answer segment. For members of the studio audience who want to ask a question, you can step up to the microphone, state your name, your address, and then your question. If you prefer to submit a question for me to ask the candidates, there are no cards on the back table that are available for you to write them down and I'll ask them. In addition, <coughs> viewers at home can ask questions by dialing the direct call line on the number shown on your screen or by sending an email to live at hcam.tv. Please remember if new people are waiting to ask a question, I'll, I'll kind of adhere to a limit of one query per person. Responses from candidates should still be kept to the maximum of two minutes. And if a question is posed to a specific candidate, I'll offer response time to all the other candidates for that office as well. And lastly, the privilege of being the first person in a group to answer will begin alphabetically and then rotate as subsequent questions are asked. Okay, we're now ready for the first question. Anyone from the audience have a question? Hi, Ed Harrow, 8 Spring Lane. Is that sufficient? Perfect. I just have a question. We have a history of some positions in this town where the same person has filled that position for an extended period of time. And I'm curious about term limits and what the candidates think about term limits. Okay, all candidates? Anyone that wishes to answer. Okay. Board of Selectmen, we'll start with you. Anyone would like to address that question? Please step up. I would love to answer that question. <laughs> I'm a big believer in term limits. If you follow me on Twitter, you will know that I'm a big believer of term limits. From the President of the United States, to a selectman, to a planning board member, to a state rep, to a state senator, to a U.S. senator, you name it, I believe in term limits. I think 12 years is a great number of years for any office held in our democracy. And I support them, and that's why I'm pledging, not pledging, I don't even like that word, I am going to serve my fourth and final term if the voters have me back. Thank you. Anyone else please come up to the three mics that want to address this? Yeah. <coughs> to another mic. Well, I believe in term limits, and I think it's certainly important to have fresh blood coming in every few years. I also believe that institutional knowledge matters. It really helps to have someone coming back who's been on the board, who knows the policies, who knows, what, knows the history. I think, it's, I think it's vitally important to have that institutional knowledge within our system, but we always need fresh blood after a while. So I think Brian, uh, I, I thank Brian for serving for eight years and, and maybe 12, <laughs> uh, nine years, sorry. Um, but I think that that type of institutional knowledge helps, but I also understand that uh, you may, may get tired after a while. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a big firm believer in term limits as well. As part of union's governance, I've always fought for that because if someone's taken that uh, 
certain elected position for one, two, three, four, five, six terms, at a point you get tired. At a point you don't fight anymore, you lose that drive that you have. So I'm a big fan of term limits. I think there should be term limits ready. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else that, uh, would like to uh, address this question? Please come up to the mic. Hi, Mark Hyman. Um, I also would concur with the selectman candidates uh, with respect to term limits. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd like to take a quick moment to, um, to point out that there are plenty of appointed boards uh, in the town that uh, frequently go wanting for members. Um, so I think there's plenty of opportunities for folks at Hopkinton to help run the town government. Um, I've experienced it with ZBA where we've had openings for a while, um, and I know some of the other boards do as well. So um, I'd, I'd implore those in town who are looking to find ways to volunteer. Um, don't just limit yourself to the elected positions. Look at the other boards, get some experience, and, and then think about what other positions you might want to look at later. Thank you. Okay, for the Board of Selectmen, um, please approach the mic. And we'll go in opposite order. Keeping the recent growth in mind, what measures will you take to balance the budget? And we'll start with Irfan. That's a great question. I think that's one of the one of the issues on everybody, everyone's mind in this in this town. I think when it comes to working on the board of selectmen, what we what we're really looking to do is work with the people and get a sense as to what is really required and what is not required. Where can we trim? This is a very difficult budget year, and the board has done a fantastic job in trying to guide our guide our town. The, as far as what specific actions I would take, I can't answer that. I don't have all the answers. What I can say is that I'm going to work cooperatively with the various boards, with, if I'm elected on the Board of Selectmen, with my fellow board members, to try to find common sense solutions that make sense. Uh, common sense makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't think there is any magic bullet. I think what it really comes down to is cooperation amongst the boards. Thank you. And then, uh, Brian? It has to be a collaborative effort between the Board of Selectmen, the School Committee, Appropriations Committee, uh, all the boards and committees in town where there's a financial interest in play. Um, I, I feel very strongly that you also should go through the budget, and myself and my colleagues uh, do this routinely, and we go b line item by line item in, the, in these budgets. Some of us get really into the details of these budgets, and we look at the number of pencils they're buying at the schools, and the schools tell us the number of pencils they're buying. So we go through a very detailed process, and I think as you question and you push and you ask uh, pointed questions about why you know th certain things need to happen within a department, and you get really solid answers, you can then weigh your decision against you know, that answer you get against the revenues you've got coming in and you can balance it all out. So it's a, it's a push-pull, there's a healthy tension that needs to take place as we balance the budget each year, but if you do it in a collaborative manner, you're going to get it done. And you know, Mass General Law requires that we do balance the budget. It's not a question of how we balance the budget or will we balance the budget. We absolutely will balance the budget, that's required. It's how we get it done which is most important. And I really think that the collaborative nature of Hopkinton and the volunteerism of all these people here tonight and those that have come before <laughs> us, that's what makes the, bu the budget process work. It can be a little tense at times, a little frustrating at times. I got a little frustrated this year, there's no question about it. It's, it's because we're all trying to do this right thing for Hopkinton and move the community forward in a positive manner. But balancing the budget is a requirement. And if you have the experience to understand how the budget works, you can get it done. Thank you. Patrick. Well, if elected uh, to selectmen, it is a give and take. It's negotiations. You've got to figure out what's good for the town, what's not good for the town. But it's also, like Irfan said, working together with the other boards and committees to find that common ground. So the main question is this, if something's coming off a budget, do we need it? How much is it going to cost us, the town? and why are we doing it? So I think taking all that stuff in, taking a hard stance, you're going to have to do once in a while, but it's working together with the other boards, working together with the other selectmen, putting our brains together and figuring it out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question is for the Board of Health, and unfortunately there are no uh, candidates here, so um, I won't read that question. Um, next for uh, Board of Selectmen and Planning Board. So let's put the planning board up first, <laughs> and then we'll go to the Board of Selectmen.
There's a current open planning board position and four applicants have applied. There seems to be a rush of appointing a new member. Shouldn't they wait until after the election? So we'll start um, alphabetically for the first question. Yeah, I agree that um, that position um, should be held off um, till after the election. Um, I think it would um, provide opportunity for people to get to know who's being appointed. Um, and thus making the decision um, easier for the planning board and the um, board of selectmen. Mark? Um, I think this question um, really is one for the selectmen and for the planning board that are here now. They're making that decision. Um, but I know that in the past, I believe it's been done both ways when there have been appointments late in the, uh, late in the er, early in the year before election uh, vacancies in the board. Um, you know, I think there's pros and cons either way. Um, I, I know. A, <laughs> Deb is a candidate in both contexts, so um, you know perhaps if we wait until after the election, um, you know it'll be a little easier on one on one ground. Um, but I think you know ultimately this is uh, this is something that the selectmen, current selectmen and planning board, have to answer. Mary, so this uh, this um, vacancy came up because of a resignation pretty late in the term here, um, and I do believe that the um, appointment of a new member to fill that vacancy should wait until after the election. I just think that um, there are so many things going on in terms of the choices for everyone in town to be um, to make the choice for, for elections that it should wait until after that point when the Board of Selectmen and the, and the Planning Board um, have a chance to, to make that decision. Thank you. Thank you. Board of Selectmen. Patrick. So appointments, you know, if there are rules in town that has been followed before, that's what you should go by. There's no reason at this time to rush an appointment with an election going on if it could be postponed. So I just, you know, if it's black and white, the way I look at things is if there's rules the way you've done it before, you could wait till after the, an election and then you wait. And let, the, let the matter settle down. We have an election going on. There's no reason to push it. Don't make case decisions pushing someone in when something could change after an election. Thank you. Brian? Recently we modified the town charter and the town charter stipulates when an opening becomes uh, available or someone steps off a board and it's elected board, there's a posting period, there's a timeline after the posting period for meetings to be held, etc. So we have a process outlined in the town charter and the board of selectmen is currently following that process. Uh, we actually had to extend a couple of days to make sure that we were following the process. Uh, the planning board has a vacancy now. The planning board has a lot going on right now. I feel very strongly we should appoint the person as soon as we can within the confines of the bylaws and the town charter. Thank you. Thank you. As an attorney, I do believe in precedent, and I believe that the precedent set in this town has been to elect someone, uh, to, to, to appoint someone after the election. Um, I think that's happened several times in the past. So I believe in following precedent. I also believe that there is uh, appointing someone before the election doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. There is no urgency at the moment, and um, we're just talking about waiting another three weeks, four weeks. Thank I think you. you should remain there unless someone, is there anyone from the audience that has a question <coughs> at this time before I go uh, to an email? Um, yeah, is it for Board of Selectmen? It is for the Board oh, of okay. Selectmen. Thank I you. know that you guys have talked about you know, collaboration. Just say your name. And Darlene uh, Hayes. Um, you talk about collaboration, things like that. I've heard Meg talk about being an ethics professor. Um, in all good ethics, and how do you guys feel about transparency and being respectful and working with other boards? And, you know, the will of other boards and things like that, that they, uh, what their considerations are. So first up will be Irfan. I think that, you know, when we have an elected form of government and we have other boards, we're really talking about who has, you know, what, what do the people want? And I think that we should really follow what the people want. So the people have, if the people elect a board and a board gives a certain recommendation, and I think that it's, uh, you know, we owe it to the people to follow the, the recommendations, or at least to listen to the recommendations of other boards um, in any decision-making process. Patrick? 
So the way I feel about things, you know, board of selectmen, I feel I'm no better than you. If you're in charge of a board, that's your board, you're going to come to me with some issues if elected. I think ethically, uh, studying law, uh, foreign norms, we study ethics a lot, we're always ethical, and I think working together instead of being adversaries, I th you know, is something we should do and something we should practice all the time. Thank you. Brian? So we're in a town meeting form of government, and the ultimate boss in the town of Hopkinton is town meeting. Town meeting dictates everything that happens between town meetings. The Board of Selectmen, the School Committee, and others then take a lot of guidance from town meeting and enact it through the 12 months in between. I'm a big believer, to Patrick's point, I'm a big believer that even though the Board of Selectmen is the chief elected officials of the town of Hopkinton, I've always viewed us as all colleagues, Board of Selectmen, School Committee, Parks and Recreation, uh, whoever it is, I'm a big believer we're all volunteers and we're all colleagues, and I've conducted myself in that manner over the years and I think a lot of folks out there would speak to that. Um, it's the only way to get things done. When you're working on that budget, to your question a few minutes ago, you've got to have a collaborative discussion. You've got to have a, uh, an understanding with each other that everybody's role is important and everybody has a voice and everyone should have a say. So I feel very strongly about that and I work very hard and have over the years to have a very coordinated and collaborative approach to governing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is also for the yeah, it's actually just a follow-up question to, oh, sure. to this. Um, with that being said, I know on Monday night, I've been watching a lot of late night HCAM, I guess, um, <laughs> very late at, at a planning board meeting at about 11.30, the planning board voted to, um, to propose three dates to the selectmen for this appointment. All three were post the election, and that was the will of the planning board. And then to see that you guys are still wanting to proceed beforehand, um, can you tell me how that's working collaboratively? So we'll start with Brian this time. So the uh, Board of Selectmen is following the charter and following the timelines outlined by the charter, and we'll continue to follow the charter. We don't get to make this up as we go along. That's when you get yourself in trouble, and that's when there's perceptions and misperceptions that develop. Uh, we will follow the charter, and the Board of Selectmen is the group that calls the meeting of a joint meeting of the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board, or the Board of Selectmen and the Parks and Recreation, or the Board of Selectmen and any other entity that's out there, or any organization that has a vacancy. So we start that process, we invite our colleagues to come in, and we can get together, and we take the vote. Thank you. Patrick. Again, like I just stated earlier, I'm no better than you. If the Planning Board has come and said, and they proposed, uh, put out three different dates, you know, that's their board, they're in charge of that. And I would respect that and hold off on it. Like I said, there's no rush to appoint somebody right away when you can hold off with everything going on. So I would respect them and work with them. That's working collaboratively together. And Irving? I think that the will of the planning board should be respected. I think that it can be respected while still following the town charter. Uh, if the planning board has suggested three different dates, um, all after the election, I think that I think the board of selectmen should um, when they're calling the meeting, they should respect the, uh, the desire of the planning board. Thank you. This question is from a home viewer. The question is for each of the candidates for selectmen and addresses the issue of so-called underrides. Three-part question. I'll do A, B, C, <laughs> being an old teacher. A, did you support the recent underride? B, would you support another underride? C, We've heard all about the virtues of underrides. What are the negatives? Did the recently passed underride contribute in any way to our budget difficulties this year? And we'll start with, I think actually, Brian, you start. OK, so the questions were, there were several questions there. Right, three parts. If you could just repeat them real quick, I'll give you my answer as you go. OK. So the first part, did you support the recent underride? Absolutely. Would you support another underwrite? Not necessarily. Uh, what are the negatives? The negatives are it creates a little bit of tension in the budget on an annual basis because it takes that tax base that we would otherwise have naturally and per law and takes that away for good. So it creates a, a, a tension that may at some point create the need for an override. So we got to be careful that we don't spend too much, go up against that excess levy limit, and then go into a potential override in a future year. So that's why I say not necessarily would I support taking another underride, even though we still have an excess levy of about a million and a half dollars. I think we're going to do a couple things with some of that money this year, but I'm very concerned that if we take it all, that we have an override situation two or three years down the road. 
and Part C, did the recently passed underwrite contribute in any way to our budget difficulties this year? Yes, it put a little tension into the process, but a little bit of tension in the budget process is a good thing. I'm a big believer that all bureaucracies, no matter what level, federal, state, local, should be a little bit hungry and craving additional cash to run their operation. It forces discipline, it forces good management practices. We've got great managers in Hopkinton running really good departments now, providing excellent services to our residents, and they have to be very mindful of money because they know they're running a very tight ship. Thank you. Okay. Could I be so bold as to ask for you to answer, All right. ask the parts um, and I'll answer them? Did as well. you support the recent underwrite? I did not. Would you support another underwrite? I might. <laughs> it depends on the circumstances of the situation. And we've heard all about the virtues of underrides. What are the negatives? Well, the reason I didn't support the underride is because I don't believe that it ever makes sense to handcuff ourselves into how much are we going to spend and how much can we, how much can we levy. I think that it makes, for me personally, I think it makes far more sense to come up with solutions and recommendations as to how much are we really going to spend, but we don't need to put the handcuffs on. I think, um, as, as Brian had stated, the underride, I believe, also contributed to the, to the shortfall this year in that we, we, we handcuffed ourselves. We said that we can't, we can't take in these funds, and, and then we have to manage it when, we, uh, when the numbers come in differently than we were expecting. A lot of this stuff is really based on projections. And we can project and hope that our numbers are right, but they're not always right. So I think a little bit of flexibility makes sense. Oh, so to be transparent, uh, underrides, overrides, budgeting, that's all new to me as a contract negotiator for a union. You know, I didn't have to understand the budget or learn any type of that yet, but you know, it's a learning experience. That's something I would you know, take on and learn real quick, just like Leslie said, something that you learn as you go, mm -hmm. and it's something I'd learn real quick, what's going on. Okay, thank you. So this school committee candidates, you guys can take a five minute break. <laughs> okay. What is your position on marijuana retail sites and how it affects students in our system? We'll start with Amanda. Um, I am actually opposed to having the recreational marijuana shops in Hopkinton. Um, I did consider uh, the availability of medical marijuana, which I think has a place in our society, and it can be difficult to access medical marijuana shops um, because there are a limited number of licenses, and I think it's important for people who need that medication, which may or may not be safer than opioids and other pain control me mechanisms, to be able to access medical marijuana. So I was very concerned about that. I do believe that there are two licenses um, underway in Framingham, which is close to Hopkinton. So um, the idea of introducing recreational marijuana shops in Hopkinton for adult use um, it, it does not sit with me in terms of the, um, the impression it leaves on our children. Because it's very complicated as a parent. I think many parents feel the same way. It's very complicated to explain to your kids how this substance is not appropriate for you and your developing brain and your developing body and yet somehow we've we've identified that it's safe for adults it's it's complicated it's confusing and i think there are a lot of um unnecessary side effects resulting from you know recreational marijuana so i am not in favor Meg. i'm not keen on the idea of selling marijuana in hopkinton um to our kids but at the same time, I worry that with so much over-regulation, we're denying them opportunities to make good choices for themselves. We're always saying, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. And, you know, having lived elsewhere than Hopkinton and visited places like Amsterdam, you see that drugs have a different life in a society where every relationship you have with them is not dictated by the law. And I, I don't want my kids smoking marijuana either, but I think that you have to give them a little more chance to choose for themselves. How are they going to grow up if they're not allowed to make those decisions? It's like saying, okay, you can't drink alcohol until you're 21. A lot of our kids do drink before 21. 
all around the world, they drink before 21. And if you don't start trusting them and treating them as adults, maybe they won't leave their childhoods behind. Thank you. This, um, this one is for the Board of Selectmen. You may take your seat. And actually, anyone else that wants to comment it after they address this question. This is from Megan Cavallo, 23 Yale Road. I know that people in town are concerned about the threat to the town's economy if our major employer leaves. Because of the pen potential high tax revenue of adult use ca cannabis facilities that would be beneficial to town, I would like to hear from the Board of Selectmen candidates or anyone else their opinions about adult use cannabis facilities opening in Hopkinton. So we will start with, I think, sure. who knows? <laughs> Who knows? I'll take it. Uh, I oppose any any shop opening up in town. I believe it's a, it's a crowd. You tend to bring in the wrong crowd. It's something this town doesn't need. You know, I grew up in the city. I grew up in Dorchester. I live in Southie, dealing with all this stuff. I've come to this town for a reason, because of small town culture and the quietness and the privacy here. So opening up a shop like that, I just, I'm, I'm just not for it. So. And then we'll go to Irfan. Now the town has a decision to make. Um, we have, you know, uh, we, you know, we do have a decision to make as to whether or not we're going to prohibit marijuana shops or allow it. I have a, I believe that um, number one, I'll respect the will of the people. That's that's most important. So if the people say no, then no. I have a bit of a nuanced approach, though. I think that there is tremendous uh, revenue that's possible. The estimates are that in the first year, the cannabis is going to be a $300 billion, uh, million dollar industry, and by 2021, it's going to be $900 billion, million. It's a lot of money. And it is something that, uh, that should be thought about. However, we haven't made any decisions on how we would regulate it. So we can't let someone in now without even looking at how are we going to allow, how are we going to regulate this. So my nuanced approach is I think that we should study this. We should take a look, and I think people should take, it, take a firm look at the benefits and the, uh, the disadvantages of having a recreational marijuana facility in town. We need to remember that just because we prohibit it in town, it doesn't mean that person can drive 20 minutes and get it. I am opposed to any kind of marijuana facility in Hopkinton Medical or otherwise. Uh, I've voted a couple of times on the Board of Selectmen over the last couple of years uh, not to support uh, any initiatives that might be going before town meeting or anything like that, so I've been consistent in my position on this. Uh, I think it follows the general will of Hopkinton, which is the job of the Board of Selectmen, to recognize the general will of the community and then act on that. Uh, the general will came out in the uh, uh, statewide referendum or question on the ballot a couple of years ago about marijuana, and Hopkinton clearly voted it down. So while it passed statewide, Hopkinton did not support marijuana uh, legalization in Massachusetts, and I think that's the, the job of the selectmen to understand all these different data points and act accordingly to move the, keep the community moving in a positive manner. I don't think bringing in a marijuana facility is going to bring a positive <laughs> you know, uh, take a positive right-hand turn for the community. I think it would be bringing, uh, to Patrick's point, uh, types of uh, situations and scenarios that I think would be detri detrimental to the community. And for that reason and many others, uh, I'm opposed to it and uh, will continue to be so if re-elected. Thank you. Any other candidate like to address this question? I would. Okay. Uh, Leslie Carey for the Board of Assessors. Um, knowing how much we have uh, tax revenue from our biggest employer in Hopkinton, I do think that we need to be look, working with the other boards and looking to see what businesses we could bring to Hopkinton. I am not a proponent of, of hitching our wagon to marijuana. There are many, many, many other opportunities to bring business into Hopkinton, and that includes I don't know, maybe we could bring some things in around employing people in the trades or bringing in some pharmaceutical, more pharmaceutical companies. Things that have 
long-standing jobs that are adding value not only to our community via money, but also to our people and not ruining their health. So I challenge everybody to think more broadly and not to hitch our wagon. Um, I would agree with Leslie. I'm, I'm opposed to, um, to finding a way through the hypothetical of EMC leaving by, um, by finding the tax revenue of a marijuana shop um, as our way to, uh, to, to get out of the budget shortfall we'd be in. Um, but I think there are other ways we can attract business to town, and we have been doing that uh, through the policies of you know, the planning board, the master plan, the selectmen uh, up till now. Um, there's a new uh, biopharma company that opened up on South Street very recently, Lake Pharma. You might have seen the banner go up that um, they plan to bring uh, as many as 100 jobs to town in the near term. Um, and that's great, great growth for the town. That in itself wouldn't replace EMC. Um, um, I'm not sure what could um, for town, and I think we'd be in some, um, in some awkward positions budget-wise if they were to leave. But um, I, I would agree with, I think, everyone else who's spoken so far on this point that um, I don't think the way to balance our budget would be um, through the tax on marijuana. Thank you. Mary, Mary Larson Marlow. I certainly support medical marijuana use in a regulated environment. And I think it's very important that um, any ballot questions, anything that we discuss at town meeting or have voted on at town election, we differentiate. I've also heard certain things about um, a ballot question um, th this time around, uh, this year, um, that would prohibit all forms of uh, marijuana, um, not just retail use, but also growing, um, agriculture, that sort of thing. And I think that we need to look at this very carefully and not do a blanket knee-jerk reaction because it does sound scary. It absolutely sounds scary to have marijuana um, retail establishments in our town. But alcohol and tobacco are sold in our town as well. And I think we all need to keep that in mind, and we need to look at this very carefully and in a nuanced way, rather than in um, absolute prohibition for all time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Please state your name and address, please. Uh, Chuck Daugherty, uh, Sanctuary Lane. Uh, for the planning board, um, I'd be interested in hearing uh, each of your comments regarding uh, the place of affordable housing uh, in Hopkinton. Uh, I understand that the town is currently uh, has excess based on state standards, but do you see um, a way forward uh, in the future uh, for more affordable housing, for maintaining what we have, uh, or for holding off for the moment. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll start with uh, Deborah. Hi, um, I, I, this is a very important question to me. Um, I believe that um, Hopkinton um, needs to grow diversely, and that means um, economically um, as well as culturally. Um, I did come from Connecticut, um, outside of New Haven, where we had cultural fairs. Um, and in Detroit, where we would um, celebrate every, everybody's culture every weekend. Um, and I think that's one thing that Hopkinton could um, cultivate, is, is bringing this affordable housing in, just di um, sort of um, in nodes around the community. Um, it creates um, harmony. It creates um, a knowledge point for students who, who um, start to go into the world. Um, and tr want to travel, they begin to know about other people's culture. So I'm very much in favor of affordable housing as, as a multicultural experience, as a, as a diversity um, of, of, of peoples um, in our community. Mark? Um, I don't think you're going to find probably anyone who will disagree that affordable housing is a good idea um, and we need it in the town. Um, I know that um, we are over our threshold now in terms of um, what the state requires us to have. Um, I, 
uh, on the 40B uh, for Hopkins and Muse that, uh, that opened up recently, that, um, you know, that really gave us a, a good number of affordable housing units in town that we didn't have before. And I think it's telling that um, it came through without a lot of objection from the town because it was done right, it was placed in a good location, um, and um, you know, I think that, that sort of development uh, with affordable housing included within it is a great idea. Um, I know there was um, at the, the Marathon Planning Board meeting that was referenced earlier um, the other night, um, another development that was approved um, recently on Chamberlain and Whalen um, where there was a requirement for affordable housing. Um, and the question was, should the developer pay into a fund for the town to develop affordable housing? Should they develop housing off-site or should they integrate it onto the site? And I think, um, you know, the planning board decided at the time to require um, off-site building, um, mainly because um, it hadn't been worked into the process at the beginning um, to be able to, um, to put a, a plan together at the last minute uh, wouldn't have worked. Um, but I think um, the idea of integrating uh, affordable housing in developments, particularly, um, you know, when they're larger developments like, like the Hopkinton Muse, um, is good. It just needs to be done right. I've lived in a community where it was done um, done a little bit awkwardly where the affordable units were all in a corner and they all looked very different um, and I don't think that benefits anyone. It doesn't serve the goals um, uh, certainly that we have in town. So thank you. Thank you. Mary? Um, I would agree with my co-candidates. Um, the state requirement should be looked at as a minimum first of all and uh, I think that too easily it might be dismissed as Oh, we've got our threshold met. It'll be met for the next 10 years. We don't have to worry about that anymore. And I don't believe that's the way to handle it. I think that every development for residential that we talk about in planning board and in the town in general, we should be looking at affordable housing as a part of those developments, as Mark was saying. These can be incorporated well and with design that uh, does not make it, you know, an obvious, oh, it's them versus us or anything like that. Um, I think that we need to encourage diversity in our community. And um, by, by looking at these plans to exceed the um, state requirement, um, I think that we can, we can accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Peggy Barton, Sanctuary Lane. This is a very basic question regarding the town master plan, which has a, um, a commitment to preserve the small town character of the town and the semi-rural atmosphere and the neighborhoods. And it seems on the contrary, we've just been on a grease streak of un unbridled growth. So I'm wondering what anybody's stand would be on honoring that commitment and preserving open space and saving neighborhoods and the natural environment, which is so much a reason why so many of us moved here. Anybody? Is that for any particular candidate? Or I don't know open? if it would be the plan. Open, okay. I guess. If anyone would like to uh, respond to that, please step up to the mic. Hi, Mark Hyman. Sure, I'll respond. Um, you know, I think. Uh, uh, and actually, could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? It's kind of a general question. Where somebody, where, where you're, would anybody have a priority on honoring the town's master plan or preserving? Uh. Thank you. The way we are and the way we've been, but we seem to be losing it hand over fist. Right. I, I think from the planning board perspective, the planning board serves two functions. Um, it, it has a, a forward-looking, proactive function for planning, and in that context, it sets up the master plan in conjunction with other, other groups in town. Um, so it sets, it sets out in that uh, in the portion you read, I think a really good, um, a really good uh, vision for what the town should try to achieve. The problem is that the planning board also serves another function, and that's that it has to deal with the applications it receives from developers. Um, and it has to deal with them under the rules and regulations of Massachusetts. Um, very much uh, um, as was discussed at the, uh, the Chamberlain Whalen hearing, um, you know, there were two alternatives towards the end where um, we took, uh, you know, the planning board would vote for a, uh, a project that wasn't perfect, 
but it didn't have a through road, or uh, they would turn it down and would get a project that the developer could build um, with a through road, and they wouldn't have a say. So sometimes the planning board and other boards are put into difficult positions where um, what they would want to do isn't what they can do under the laws. So um, I, you know, I think there's, there's always room for some compromise, um, but there's limits on, on the planning board, the selectmen, and any of the boards when it comes to trying to achieve the master plan. Thanks. Hi, um, I would um, agree with Mark on um, many of those issues. Um, I would, but I would take a little bit of a different step, and I and I've thought a lot, a lot, and, and hard about this. I would revisit it open-ended um, statements in the master plan, one which creates um, an environment where we can create as we go along. So I would have the planning board step back and take a look at some of the verbiage that's in there and use it as a, as a jumping, a springboard to what, what, it, what we can envision and, and create in our community. Um, I would con continue the great work of the Trails Committee and, um, the, and the yet to be initiated downtown corridor project. Um, I, would f I would also focus on creating the completion of the host agreements that were made for Legacy Farms and some of the other developments. I think that cleans up our town. I think it integrates community into involvement in the planning, and I think it should be a continual effort. It shouldn't end with the, the date 2017. Uh, so one of the reasons why I moved to this town was because of the uh, small town culture, you know, hearing that master plan, I love that master plan. I think you want to keep those scenic roads, we don't want to overdevelop. And just being in the past five years, you know, you see the sudden growth in this town with population and buildings going up. You know, I think it's important to take a step back, see what's going on, let's slow things down, but work with other departments because times are changing, so we still need to grow, but I think working with planning board and everything else, you know, you can give and take and come to a good solution with that. Anyone else want to address? As a current planning board member, um, <laughs> I do want to say, you know, as on, on the planning board, we do have a forward thinking aspect in the master plan. But we also have to deal with the plans that are brought before us. And there, we have to balance private property rights versus what do we want in this town and how can we follow that master plan? I can say that I think that I'm, I'm proud of the work I've done at the planning board and I think that um, the board itself has done well and that we've preserved open space um, with, with open space plans that come before us when they come with a conventional plan. We encourage the, the open space plan. We encourage trail networks. We encourage, you know, in any, any new development that, um, that we try to keep that same small town character but we have to balance that against the private property rights of the developers. So we do our best. Thank you. Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. Um, I am also a member of the planning board, but I'm here as a resident asking this question. It is, in fact, on the appointment uh, for filling the vacancy on the planning board. Um, it has been asserted here tonight that we are following the stipulations in the charter, and I respectfully disagree. And I read from the charter that was uh, recorded in February, or submitted February 2017. Filling of vacancies, except as otherwise provided in this charter, if there is a failure to elect or if a vacancy occurs in the membership of an elected board or committee, the remaining members of the board or committee shall give notice to the board of selectmen and to the public of such vacancy in accordance with the provisions of section 6.4 of this charter. The board of selectmen with the remaining members of such board or committee shall, not less than one week after notice of the date of, w of which the vote is to be taken, fill such vacancy until the next town election, emphasis is mine, by a joint vote. The appointment to fill a vacancy shall be made by the affirmative vote of a majority of the persons entitled to vote on such vacancy. So uh, we do understand that the town attorney has said that we can vote early, um, but certainly we are not obligated to vote early. Uh, my question really is about transparency and respect for process and predictability of process and how much each of the candidates on the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board value the public's trust and maintaining the public's trust in a regard such as this. So you'd like to hear from the Selectmen and Planning Board? I would. On to front and center. <coughs> Brian? 
Muriel raises an excellent point, and that's exactly what I checked with town council on before I made my decision about what I thought we should do in ter terms of replacing a, a planning board member. Uh, town council did weigh in, read, reading that very uh, passage of the charter, and gave me input that we're following the charter, and we should proceed if that's what the board wants to do, and that's what I would suggest we do do. Thank you. Uh, again, like I said earlier, you know, there's, there's no rush to appoint somebody and we have an election going on, just like the Charter said, let's wait until the election happens, and then we vote on it. I want to respect the democracy, our voting system, and I don't think we should push it forward by any means. Okay. I believe the question was talking about transparency in government and in, with regard to filling this seat. I think that um, we should be transparent in, in how we're proceeding and how we want to go about this. Uh, I think we can, we can certainly follow the charter. I think the charter is, is, is clear that we can, you know, we can fill the, uh, fill the vacancy after the election. Um, I think we should, in the interest of transparency, we should listen to what the planning board had recommended. And I think that's how we should go forward. Thank you, planning board. Let's start with Mary. Well, I, I do believe that this is less about one particular appointment, more about transparency. And um, I believe that it's very important that um, the public understand what's going on, that nothing is, is rushed through, um, and that there's plenty of time for um, communication to um, everyone who is in Hopkinton about what is going to be happening um, regarding an appointment. Um, Mark? Um, I think with respect to transparency, uh, you know, my understanding is that the meeting that this appointment will be made at is going to be a public meeting. It's going to have to be noticed and posted and uh, everybody can come. Um, my understanding is also that the candidates are already set. Um, the, the deadline's passed for people to put their hats in the ring. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think the charter uh, that was quoted by Muriel before says that it, it should be done within a week or, uh, you know, if, if, that's, if that's the way the town council reads it. Um, that can be done. Um, I don't think it's been the way it's been done in the past, but maybe the charter change affected that. Ultimately, I think the Just issue here is going to be uh, one where uh, there's a dispute or perhaps a disagreement between some of the planning board and some of the selectmen about how to do this. And, um, uh, you know, they're going to have to tr figure out a way to work collaboratively to, uh, to achieve it. Um, and, and I think it's up to those individuals. Okay. I think it has to do with transparency, but I also think it has to do with the direction of government as well. Um, and I think that if it's, it has to do with cooperation. And I'd like to see this be an example on a time where we, we cooperate um, and, and we have a huge um, agenda May 7th for town meeting. And again, um, I, I'll concur with Mary. I, there's no reason to rush. Um, these are appointed positions. They're one-year positions. Um, let, the, let them um, learn who these candidates are, and um, let's, fi let's find it out when it's necessary, not before. Uh, I just wanted to clarify for the public. Um, Mark, I'm not uh, disagreeing with you, but it's not that it has to be done within seven days. It's that it can't be done sooner than seven days after notice is posted. I just wanted to clarify that for the public. Um, and Mr. Herr commented that it was the will of the board, and I just wanted to make sure for the public's information that the planning board, in fact, voted to wait until after the election, so it is the will of one board and not the will of the other board. Please state your name and address first. Yep. Amy Rodebush, 54 Grove Street. I had a question on, a different question on, a different question on transparency for the Board of Selectmen. Come on up. <laughs> All right, so I anyone who kn knows me knows that I like to follow the town government, especially the budget process in detail. Um, and um, and I, thankfully, HCAM is wonderful. They can, with a little bit of notice, they can cover any meeting and put it on video and put it on YouTube the next day, which I love. But this, uh, this season, um, there were three uh, joint budget meetings with Selectman Appropriations and School Committee, and, it was, and they were not held in their usual location. And so it was not announced in advance if they would be televised or not. And I reached out to, to find out to the Selectman and the, um, 
and the town manager and got radio silence about whether they would be televised or not, which was really disappointing to me. So I, I changed my schedule and made sure I could be at these meetings so I could at least witness it in person even if it wasn't going to be recorded. And I felt with this difficult budget year, it is so important for the public to be able to see um, what's happening. And thankfully, they did end up being televised, but I was really frustrated that they wouldn't even respond to me and, and tell us in advance that they would be televised. So I'm hoping to know if this, the selectmen candidates would commit to having all budget meetings televised next year. Okay. Absolutely. I think in the interest of, of uh, transparency and letting every, everyone should see what we're doing. Um, we're, if, if, I were, if I were to be elected to the Board of Selectmen, um, we're a public board. And I think uh, any kind of deliberations or anything that we're talking about should be, uh, we should be encouraging people to see what we're talking about and see what the issues in the town are. And fortunately, we have this wonderful HCAM um, facility that, that allows us to do so. Uh, yeah, transparency is very important. So if I was elected, I would you know, say that I would make sure every budget meeting was televised. Because you know, I work for the people. I want you guys to know what you have, what's your money that we you know, end up spending. So let's let you guys know what's going on. Brian? I think it's a great question. I appreciate the question. And the same day that you were on the phone calling in trying to figure out why it wasn't televised, I was on the phone calling in saying, why isn't this televised? I'm a big believer in putting all of our meetings uh, on, uh, on HCAM TV so everybody can watch or watch videos of it later. Uh, I'm not a big fan of meetings outside our normal meeting schedule. If we are focused and we run a tight meeting, we can get everything done in the meeting schedule that we have. I think this year with the budget process and the challenges we had, it did require some additional meetings. I get that part, but I was not in favor of them being outside the, the public view and I was not in favor of them not being televised. In other words, I wanted them to be televised and had conversations with my colleagues in the town manager's office about that. Uh, I think eventually we got it worked out, but it was a frustrating couple of days on a couple of those meetings. Uh, and next year I would absolutely commit to it again. Uh, keep in mind, I'm 105 and we have four other colleagues and they're great people and they work very hard on behalf of the community and sometimes we have different opinions. I'm not a wallflower, as I think a lot of folks know, and I'll share my opinion and I'll disagree openly when I disagree with someone, uh, hopefully politely and respectfully. And in that particular situation, I disagreed with a couple of my colleagues about not televising. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. At this time, we'll end the questioning to allow candidates an opportunity to address the audience with closing remarks. Once again, please adhere to the two-minute time limit. And for closing statements, we'll reverse the order. So our first speaker will be uh, school committee candidates. Meg? Thank you, Kathy. Kathy and I do body combat together, so it's quite a revelation to see us wearing these normal clothes. Um, more money is not the solution. A $45 million operating budget is more than enough to serve 3,500 students. What we need in our town, in our district, is vision, the ability to look to the future and to risk innovation. We need to think with care about where the money actually goes into the system. Are we making all these choices with the necessary caution and care? Is the funding actually being put in the right places? Why don't we have, for instance, more collaborative programs with neighboring towns to help build special education programs that could serve our children? Might this be better than spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on outside placements? What about bringing townspeople, senior citizens with their collective trove of wisdom into the classroom to offer support where it's needed? Complacency is dangerous. Resting on our laurels is dangerous. We need to risk disagreeing with each other so that we can have fruitful arguments. I realize that it's easy to get lost in the details of arrangements and to be befuddled as I have been by the dizzying arrays of figures in columns in the town budget. But I worry that we're losing sight of the larger picture. What is best for our children? That is where we must begin with each individual child, her dreams to be a neuroscientist, his challenges in social settings, their amazing and unstoppable strengths of mind and heart. Thank 
Thank you. Amanda Fagiano. Well said. Okay. Um, I just want to thank the Hoppington Women's Club for this opportunity to meet all of you, uh, either on TV or in person. Um, I think it's really important um, as a member of EHOP, I've have been promoting um, involvement, civic engagement, and now I'm walking the walk, and I think it's important that all of the community be able to see the candidates, and so I thank you for this opportunity. I also want to thank HCAM, because everywhere I go, you're there, and I think it's been a great resource for me as a citizen to keep track of uh, what happens in our town. Um, I hope that all of you came here today and you at home have had a chance to learn a little bit about my candidacy for school committee. Um, I'd like to invite you to uh, follow my Facebook page at Amanda for Hopkinton. And I really would like to hear from more residents about your concerns, your questions, um, or ideas that you have for the schools as well. You can email me at Amanda for at gmail.com. And if you are looking for a thoughtful and dedicated and experienced person to represent you on school committee, to support growth for all learners, and to prepare our kids for success in the global economy, I respectfully ask that you vote for me, Amanda Fargiano, on May 21st. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Any board candidates, please? We'll start with Mary. Again, thank you all for coming tonight, for watching on TV, or those who watch later um, on the video, and to the Hopkinton Women's Club and HCAM for, for um, hosting this event. It's very important. and. I wish that I had known about it for the last 15 years, <laughs> um, but uh, that was my own fault. <laughs> this is a great opportunity to learn about the candidates. And I also want to thank my co-candidates for planning board, both of whom I think are excellent candidates, <laughs> and everyone else who gives their time and energy in volunteering for this town. Um, we are um, a, a, a great community because of the people who are here and who volunteer um, because our government is based on volunteers. Um, I want to offer that I would be um, an open-minded candidate, a, a good listener on the planning board, and um, um, a hard worker who pays attention to details. And I would be honored to serve on the planning board for Hopkinton for all of you. Thank you. Mark, um, I'd also uh, join everyone in thanking the Women's Club and HCAM for, uh, for hosting this event um, and for everyone here um, and online um, and on the, uh, on the cable for watching it. Um, I'll encourage you all to come out and vote, um, although if you're watching or here, you probably don't need that encouragement. So, um, you know, I, I first got interested in land use issues. Um, probably 15, 16 years ago, um, living down in Maryland when um, a commercial developer was going to put up a commercial development right next to my residential um, home that I had just bought, first one. Um, and they were doing it uh, with a new development uh, coming in, so there weren't many residents to, uh, to know or complain. Um, and I got involved to negotiate with that commercial developer when they went for their, um, for their easements and variances um, to make it a better fit for the, uh, for the community. Um, so I come to um, the issues that Planning Board deals with from that perspective. Um, and um, since then, I've you know, had um, almost two decades of experience in law. Um, I've spent four years with the, um, with the Hopkinton uh, Board of Appeals looking at the exceptions to issues with regarding zoning and land use. Um, I'd like to bring that experience and, um, and my approach to trying to find uh, solutions that everyone can get behind, even if they're not necessarily the best um, for any one individual. Um, I'd like to bring that to the planning board and uh, and help us, um, you know, civilly work through um, some issues that are contentious. So, again, I'll encourage you to come out and vote on the 21st, and I'll ask for your vote for planning board. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Once again, I want to thank um, HCAM and the Women's Club for um, providing this event and this forum. And I also like to compliment my, um, my, my co-candidates um, for the planning board and all the other candidates who had wonderful speeches today. Um, I learned so much, um, and I would um, like to continue to learn. Um, as a member of the Zoning Advisory Committee, um, we, we selectively answered some of the questions that the planning board didn't have time to do. 
And one of my goals would be to make the process of the planning board a little bit more predictable so that, so that it doesn't have to be um, mutually exclusive of, of the, of the um, town concerns. Um, so how do you balance what the property owners want and what the com com um, community says it wants? The planning board does not get to choose or pick, but we can guide people through the process. And what I'd like to help people with is to educate them on what the terminology is, where is their leverage, and what, what we can do um, to follow that up. As a part of the electoral process, we need to realize where we have in input and where we don't have input, and I'd like to help guide that. Um, the planning board is an advocate. The planning board is a tool, and um, I hope that people in the future will realize that in, in our structure we could promote that. Um, and again, thank you very much for providing this forum. Um, Deborah Feinberg, May 21st. Thank you. The Board of Library Trustees, please. Stanley, we start with you. Hi. Um, I'd like to address a couple of things. Um, Nan had some concerns about the library's hours of operation. I, I'm too concerned about that. Um, I've been attending the library board's meetings for the last couple of months just so I can stay current with what's going on. And they have been discussing this. There are a few things. Um, that govern the library's hours of operation. One is obviously budget. If you're going to add to the hours of the library, you've got to pay for some people. The other is the population of the town, and I don't have those numbers with me exactly. Um, while I'm up here, um, I've been working with the friends of the library for the last, well, three weeks or so, uh, preparing for their annual book sale. It's a huge fundraiser for the friends of the library. They the money that they get from that covers things that aren't in the town's budget. Uh, it might surprise you to learn that the town <clears throat> only allocates, like, it's under 1% of the overall budget goes to the library. So it's a very important fundraiser. If you get a chance to go by there and uh, pick up some books, I'd appreciate it. I'd also appreciate your vote on May 21st. Thank you. And uh, Thank you very much, Steen, for telling me that news. Um, I um, didn't tell you about my education. I have a Bachelor's of Art in Education in English. I have a Master's Degree in Librarianship. Um, I have Life Certification for Teaching in the State of Massachusetts. And I have School Certification for Library. Um, I think I could make a difference in the library trustees. Um, I'm a new person. and. Um, Maybe I could give them some ideas. I hope to get your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Board of Assessors. Thank you. So although I'm uncontested, I think it's really important to participate in this event tonight. And I am honored to be on the Board of Assessors now, and I want to con continue serving. Volunteerism, engagement, and collaboration. Those are the things that differentiate the town of Hopkinton and make us strong. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, the Board of Selectmen. And we'll start with Irfan. I'm going to assume our same positions. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Come on, mix it up. I want to thank the uh, Hopkinton Women's Club for inviting us here. And I want to apologize to everyone on the left side of this room who can't really see me. Hey, how you doing? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I really want to thank all of the candidates here. I think what this really shows is that we love our town and we want to participate in it. And I know that we have a, you know, Democrat and Republican, and I guess unenrolled, um, you know, a uh, letter attached to our, to our names. But I think the letter that really counts is that we should all have an H there. Because I think we all, that's what we really care about. I think the town is in good hands moving forward. Just look at the number of people that are here. I believe that I would be a wonderful candidate for the Board of Selectmen because of my background and because of my experience. I'm an environmental attorney. Uh, who also a uh, real estate and environmental attorney. I've been practicing for 20 years. 
I've uh, served on the planning board, and I've been living in this town since 1981. I brought my family back here to raise my family because this is the community that I love. It's the type of people that I think, uh, I think adds value to how I raise my family. I respectfully request your vote on May 21st. Thank you. Ryan. This has been a great event. Thank you for hosting, and thank you to the Women's Club, and thank you to HCAMP for having us here tonight. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed the questions. They've been great questions, good questions, tough questions, questions where people want answers, and that's what makes Hopkinton so great. This is a clear example. This evening, this is a great example of why Hopkinton is such a great place to live, work, and raise a family. And I really appreciate the questions that were asked. And while sometimes, obviously, there were some disagreements or different thoughts on how some of those questions should have been answered, uh, that's what also makes Hopkinton great. We have a very vibrant democratic process here in Hopkinton. We can agree to disagree at times. We have to agree to disagree at times. It's how it works. And uh, I really do appreciate it tonight. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate all the candidates coming out. This is great to see so many new people, as I said early on. And uh, I'm looking forward to the election. I would appreciate your vote on May 21st for my fourth and final term, Ed. And uh, if, if the voters will have me back, it would be an honor to serve one more time. Thank you. Thank you. And Patrick. I want to thank you once again for hosting this event. Uh, it was a great experience. I want to thank HCAM and all of you for coming out and all of you at home who are watching. I want to thank my co-candidates, a great group over here, as well as everyone else who takes the time to show you they want to volunteer. Why? Because this town, it's a great town. It's changed. Times are changing. I feel that this town has to change as well. Even though we're growing at a rapid pace, you know, let's slow, a little, so slow it down a little bit and take a look at what's going on, but we still need to grow. And I think as a new person to this town, coming from the city, new ideas come in. New thoughts, new ideas, working with different people, and I think I can bring that change to the town. So uh, my background with union negotiations, that would be my skill set bringing to the Board of Selectmen if elected. You know, dealing with people, other boards, communicating, uh, listening, very important. And I, and I have that drive and I have that passion. And hopefully uh, I'll pass the bar soon and I can call you co-counsel there, Nifran. Uh, that's coming up real soon. And you know, I just continue to educate myself. You know, I have a, a passion to learn. And if elected, there's things I'm not gonna know, like I said, transparency, but you know, I'll pick up right away. And I'm here for the town. I chose to live here for a reason. It's the number one school system to me. It's that small town culture. And, and that's why I wanna stay and take the time here. Thank you. On behalf of the Hopkinton Women's Club, I'd like to extend a special thank you to the candidates who participated in this event tonight and to the studio audience and television viewers for joining us this evening. I also want to acknowledge the HCAM TV staff and the crew for making this broadcast possible and the Women's Club members, especially our esteemed timekeeper Annette Proudman and the high school students Dan Sinicol and um, Megan Swad. And lastly, I'd like to give a little accolade to Nancy Clark, who really was the face of the moderator for years, a tough act to follow. She's in Florida enjoying life and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> we hope this program has been informative, and we encourage all registered voters to vote in the town election on Monday, May 21st. All Hopkinton precincts vote at the middle school between the hours of 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Absentee ballots are available at the town clerk's office and we invite those of you in our live audience to now join us for an informal reception with the candidates. Thank you all and good night. And we have goodies. <laughs> um.